giving praise in this place this morning. Come on. We worship you, Jesus. Wow, well, good morning. Wasn't that a powerful video? Wasn't that a powerful worship set? Hallelujah. I hope you're ready for a powerful word. Like, you got to understand, this is all worship. All right? So I want to welcome those who maybe haven't been here before today and welcome you to Freedom Destiny Church, where we uh, t- truly believe in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit here because of what Jesus Christ did for us. And so maybe you're experiencing some things and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't understand. Let me tell you, experiencing feelings is okay. It's okay to experience some feelings, but we'll make sure that we channel them according to God's will, all right? Now, um, I want to take a moment here. If, if some of the uh, people were going out now to help with other things, so there are empty chairs here throughout. So please, if you want to sit down, there are empty chairs. I have one right up here where I was sitting that's available as well. Don't worry, I don't bite, so it's okay. You know, because usually the most popular seat in the church is the back seat. But I'm just telling you, there's some seats, and there's some over here, and I see some over here. So if you uh, are wanting to seat uh, a seat, please come and sit down. Um, Now, uh, I also wanted to just remind you all that afterwards, we're having a big festival. We have food, free food, and we're going to have bounce houses for the children. You might have saw maybe one of them was the little deformed. Hopefully that's fixed right now. Praise the Lord. The wind took it and ripped off the cord, and so they came to give us another cord. Um, and we're also going to have an egg hunt for the children. So, um, you know, if you didn't have plans to stay, we're going to have food so you can hang out, and um, it's going to be fine. It's not going to rain. So you can just stay. And um, I also want to let you know that um, Wednesday or Friday night, wow, we had an incredible praise and worship night here. And, and that was just phenomenal on Good Friday to do that. And I know for some of us, it just doesn't seem to end. It, it just keeps building. And it's like, man, you know, it's like, wow. And that's the Holy Spirit presence in us. And that's a good thing to understand. And so we just need to learn how to channel it. We just need to learn how to channel it, folks. So, and then last night, uh, the Life Plus group had about 50 of us here. We did a Seder meal, which is what the, the Hebrews do to this day. The Jews do to celebrate the Passover. The only difference is we know that Jesus came and is risen, and so that's what we're celebrating because everything within that meal points to Jesus Christ. So before we begin now, I want to um, you know, ask you all, this is a personal opportunity for each and every person here today. You know, We'll have an altar call at the end, the traditional altar call, but let me tell you, at any point during the praise and worship, at any point during when, when you hear somebody speaking, at any point when you're listening to the music, if you want to receive Jesus Christ, all you have to do is ask him. I, wanna, I believe in you and I want you into my heart. That's what you need to do. Maybe while you're hearing me, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we're going to hear some word of God today. And, and if you want to receive Jesus, then you don't have to wait for the traditional time at the end. Now we're gonna have that. But I'm telling you, if you're sitting there or when the band gets up again, and maybe you're a little intimidated because there's a lot more people here today. You can do it right where you're at and go, Lord, Lord, I want you in my life. I confess that I have a hole in my heart and I need your son Jesus to fill it. Folks, It's not the way you say the words. It's your heart. It's your heart. All right? So join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this glorious day that oh so many years ago, your son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua Yamashiach, was risen. We thank you, Father God, as we're going to have a festival today, we're going to have a party to celebrate you. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us today with this beautiful place, Father God, with all these people serving, Father God. We bless, we ask, Father God, for your blessings over each and every family here, Father God. And as we hear your word now, Father, we ask, Lord, that you open our hearts to receive it. You open our minds to be renewed, Father God. You open our eyes and take the scales off them, Father. And we thank you, Lord, 
for each and every one of these requests through Jesus' mighty and matchless name. And every one of us said, Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to talk today about the way to Emmaus. Now, this is a road. There's a story in the Bible about this. It's called the road to Emmaus. And these two disciples of Jesus were walking that road this very mo morning, this resurrection morning, more than, you know, about 2,000 years ago. And this road to Emmaus is a road that has to be walked by every single one of us if we want to mature and continue transforming to the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now, that Emmaus Road walk started out in disbelief, and it was kind of sad for those two. And frankly, if, if we're honest about ourselves, many of our journeys start out just like that. But you know what? It ended in joy. It ended in excitement. It ended in true devo devotion and love to Jesus Christ. And that same experience is available for each and every willing soul that will bow their knee to Jesus Christ. Like all of Christ's appearances to those two disciples after the resurrection, his appearance to the two Emmaus disciples involves a story. So we're going to talk about that story a little bit now. So to start out, we're going to ask, well, who, who were these two disciples? Now, if we dig a little bit into the Gospels, we will find out who they are. For starters, in Luke chapter 24, verse 18, we have the name of one of the disciples. The name is Cleopas. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him. And then you'll find a second mention of Cleopas's name in another account of the resurrection in a different gospel. It's the gospel of John. John chapter 19, verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. So we kind of get the name of both of them right there. See, we learn that the wife of Cleopas was present in Jerusalem at the time of the crucifixion. Therefore, I don't think it's too far of a stretch. I don't think we have to really investigate too far to assume that she was the other one on the road with Cleopas as they were returning from Jerusalem to Emmaus on that morning all those years ago. And yes, it's very neat. Wow, we can pat ourselves on the back that we've been able to identify who these two disciples were. But let's not lose focus on what the bigger picture is. See, we must not forget that the disciples who were last seen in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus had stopped in the midst of his return to Bethany from Jerusalem, they all scattered and no doubt returned to Bethany. The Bible tells us that the disciples fled that, that situation right then when Jesus was captured. And they probably wouldn't have stayed in Jerusalem. They probably would have fled away from Jerusalem. And they probably would have fled away to where they were having dinner when they were having dinner called the Last Supper. And they were planning to go to Bethany. So they probably said, well, we're just going to all meet up in Bethany. They probably didn't talk about it because the soldiers were coming to take Jesus. And what did they all do? They scattered. They were afraid. They were just talking the talk. They did not walk the walk at that point. See, so, and at any rate, with the exception of Peter and John. See, Peter and John, they kind of followed, the Bible tells us, and watched what was going on with Jesus. None of the other, other disciples mentioned stayed in Jerusalem until after, or we were seen in Jerusalem until after the resurrection. And don't forget that they would not have traveled on the Sabbath. Now, I'm trying to piece some things in here for us to understand. And remember, it's about these two disciples on the way to Emmaus. So scripture tells us that only two disciples of Jesus that they knew about the, cru they knew the crucifixion was. These only disciples here I'm talking about. So here they are. The, the ones that knew about it were Peter and John. Okay, It was the, uh, the women we just saw in John that said they were present at the cross, right? including Cleopas's wife, Mary. And, you know, I guess whatever other acquaintances Jesus... Uh, might have made with some other disciples we don't know about. But we do know this, that those other nine disciples, remember Judas was already gone. He hung himself. Those other nine disciples are not mentioned until after the resurrection. So let's kind of reconstruct, if you will, what happened. Now, the wife of Cleopas, as we know, had been present at the foot of the cross. She had seen Jesus Christ crucified 
the nails driven into his hands, and the cross erected. She saw the blood. She saw Jesus. She heard him cry out, and she saw him cry out. She experienced the darkness when the sun came and got dark, right? They blocked out the sun. She saw the blood, right? And finally, she saw the spear driven into Jesus' side. So I don't think she'd have any doubt that Jesus was dead. And when the crucifixion was over, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, went on her way to prepare for the Passover. Now, I know this can get a little hard because there's a lot of Marys. There are. There's like four or possibly five Marys. So I'm just trying to, I'm making sure you understand. This Mary is the wife of Cleopas. Not Mary, the mother of Jesus. Not Mary Magdalene and not another Mary. Okay? All right. Good. You're alive. Hallelujah. All right. So the Passover came, and Mary and Cleopas observed it like obedient, faithful Jews, all right? Now, think about it. I mean, no doubt that Passover was probably a very sad Passover. I mean, this is a festival for them and for those two and the others that saw what had just happened to Jesus. It was probably a pretty sad Passover for them. And so they could not travel back to Emmaus yet, until the Sabbath with, was over, which would have been at sunset. So it's not likely that the, and the distance between Jerusalem and Emmaus is seven miles, the Bible tells us. So it's not likely that they would have set out at dark when the sun was setting that evening to, you know, to go back. Because they just also had a dreadful experience. I mean, maybe if their spirits were high and they were good, they probably said, no problem. But they were probably really down in the dumps. They were sad. They were probably very depressed. And so they... Didn't leave that evening. So they begin traveling back on to the way to Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus, after the Saturday Sabbath, which is end at sunset. So they'd start Sunday morning. So Cleopas' wife Mary went to the tomb to anoint the body with the other women. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. So I would imagine that it's very likely that since the Bible says Mary was there, Cleopas probably was staying home, maybe getting up a little late on a Sunday morning. And they knew they were going to be traveling back, so maybe he started the preparations for their trip back. Maybe he started packing. So Mary, the wife of Cleopas, seeing the angels, returns to tell Cleopas about it. And then, this is what, where it kind of gets utterly... Remarkable, and only for us because we know what happens. But see, this is going to apply to a lot of us. She joined Cleopas in preparing to travel back to Emmaus. So far from their thinking was, was any idea of the literal, literal truth of Christ's bodily resurrection. So what is more, during this time that Cleopas and Mary were getting ready to leave, the other women who were there that morning, right, they, they went back and told Peter and John that they had met this angel. And they told them, this is what we saw. Jesus wasn't there, and an angel told us, he's risen. So then Peter and John, the Bible says in one version, where I think Peter bolted. He bolted to see it, you know. And they entered the tomb, and Jesus wasn't there. And then it says Peter and John returned to tell all of the other disciples now that were left there in Jerusalem, including probably Cleopas and Mary, because they're disciples, referred to by Jesus as disciples, right? What they had seen. And then what's really remarkable about Cleopas and Mary is they just went right back on packing. I mean, they, they, they're hearing this. She sees that he's not there, and they went back packing for their trip. And as soon as they were ready, they left Jerusalem. So here's the deal. Did this couple, at this point, Sunday morning, all those years ago, Jesus is resurrected, did they believe in his resurrection? Not at this point. No. They had been with him, we're assuming, three to three and a half years, watching all the miracles. He had talked to them about this. Did they believe at this time? They did not believe. Right? I mean, think about it. They could not even take, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes to go investigate a little further. Nope. Got to get back home to Emmaus. You know, the game's on. 
Oh, that struck a chord. <laughs> See, you might be thinking right now, some of you, that that's a little too harsh of a conclusion to come to. Like, come on, Adam. Surely they must not have heard the reports from the resurrection of Jesus. Well, I will point out here, the Bible shows us that the, exa- the words of Cleopas himself contradict that. Because when Jesus eventually appears to them on that road to Emmaus and starts walking with them, and he asks them, hey, why are you two so sad? Why are you so downcast? Cleopas answers Jesus by telling him first about the crucifixion, and then he adds this in Luke chapter 24, verse, starting with verse 22. Now, this is Cleopas talking to this stranger, they think, but this is really Jesus. He goes, well, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. So, so here we got Cleopas and Mary knew that the tomb was empty. But they didn't understand that Jesus had risen, and they were filled with sadness. So, despite the woman's witness, which was verified by the other disciples, Peter and John, and despite the biblical prophecies of this very event, they still didn't believe. And in addition... (laughs) They were walking away from the very place. They were walking in the wrong direction because they should have stayed in Jerusalem with the fellowship of the other believers to help them, right? I know there are some here today who have a hard time believing in the resurrection of Jesus. Oh, I was one of them at one point, okay? Well, for those disciples, now I'm talking about Mary and Cleopas here. For those two disciples, it took the living, breathing Jesus the resurrected, living, breathing Jesus in their very midst to convince them. My point is, there are some people here, I don't think it's too far-fetched to say, that have an expectation of, you know, and and these are people probably you, and I'm not pointing out because I was an unbeliever at one time. I guarantee there are unbelievers here right now that want to see the living Jesus before they believe. Well, you know what? There are many people here called Christians who need to give them a witness of what a living, breathing Christian looks like so that they can have an experience with a living, breathing creature that believes in Jesus Christ. That's how that works. Don't get so hard on them because it used to be you and me. Cleopas and Mary, folks, were there and they saw all that. They walked them and they needed to see it. So don't think it's too far-fetched to have somebody sitting next to you or somebody in this room that needs to see it through you and I. How do you do that? Well, get ready because it's called serving. It's called sacrificing. It's called shutting your mouth when you want to let them have it. (laughs) I'm serious. That's usually the quickest way. Oh, you call yourself a Christian. You call yourself a Christian and then you're going to talk to me like that? Oh, really? You call yourself a Christian and you're posting that on Facebook like that? You're tweeting like that? You're going to those places like that, and you're talking about me? You're driving like that? (laughs) And you got your nice little Freedom Destiny sticker on the back? (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) Woo-woo! My point is this. Yes, we've all missed Jesus at some point. And once... We have found Jesus too often. We withdraw from the strength found in other believers. See, usually when we come, become preoccupied with our dashed hopes and frustrated plans is when we'll walk away from the city of peace, Jerusalem. See, so at this point in the story, Cleopas and Mary may not have yet believed, and they were going home to Emmaus. For them, it seems all over. The dream was dead, and they were very sad. And as they made their way on that road to Emmaus, Jesus kind of shows up and saunters alongside of them, but they didn't recognize him. Because the last time they had seen Jesus, he was bruised, bloody, and he was hanging on a cross. 
But now here he's walking with them in his glorified body, and they didn't know who he was. So as they're going on their way, Jesus draws near to them, as he does to all who walk the road to Emmaus, and asks them, why are you sad? Now, if there is ever a reply that is filled with misconceptions and misunderstanding, it is the one that Cleopas gives him here. Let's, let's read this. Continuing on. Now, it's in Luke chapter 24 again, but it's a few verses earlier when they initially dialogue with Jesus. So one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, and this is Jesus, asked Jesus, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Jesus goes, what things? Cleopas says, about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. Now, I want you to focus on something here. I find it extremely interesting. They said, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Very, this is a God thing right here, that the word redeemed is used. Because that's exactly, precisely the reason for Christ's death on the cross. He was redeeming humanity. However, Cleopas and Mary were thinking of a different kind of redemption. Jesus Christ was redeeming them from sin. And all they were thinking of was redeeming them from Rome. Redemption means to buy out of slavery and to set free. And they had been hoping, praying, that Jesus was the Messiah. The one who would make them free as a nation and set them up with an earthly king, much the same way that it had been under King David centuries earlier. Now, God's plan, God's will, was to send his son Jesus to shed his blood to die in order to redeem humanity from sin once and for all. Amen. But that, oh, they didn't care about that. That's what that, not, they weren't looking for that. That wasn't on their agenda for that day. See, and you know what? That's, that's not on any of our, most of our agendas. We're not looking for that either. See, Yes, we all want freedom from oppression, right? But the reason we want freedom from oppression is so we can pursue our own will. We don't want anything to hinder what we want to do. We love to have our problems solved, but we don't want the problems of sin solved quite so readily. See, the world today is the exact same kind of world when these two were walking that road to Emmaus. They were so caught up in the world's admiration of political power, military might, that they were unprepared for the reversal of values in God's kingdom. See, Jesus shows them, and he's been showing them, and they weren't getting it. He, she said, the last shall be first. Jesus said, life grows out of death. See, he says, God's kingdom says that we are to serve, not be served. See, the world today has not changed its values. It's the same kind of thing. See, a, ser a suffering servant is no more popular today than it was 2,000 years ago. But folks, you and I have the witness of the Old Testament prophets. We have the witness of the New Testament apostles, right? And the history of the church all points to Jesus' victory over death. That's why we're here today. That's why that's the biggest crowd of people every time of year is this time because we'll come to hear this message again. We'll come to hear what it's all for. But here's the deal, and it's a personal deal. It's not that person sitting next to you. It's not that person over there that you might have had an argument with. It's your personal deal. Here's the deal. Will you forgive because you've been forgiven? Will you serve because you've been served the ultimate gift? It's free. Like that video was telling us, like the words in these songs we were singing, like the words in the Bible. Will you 
humble yourselves and come to me and just tell me that you want to be rid of sin. That's why I shed my blood. That's why I did that for each and every one of you. Past, present, and future. That's why I did it. And it's done once through me, not through you, not through your good works, not through your good talk, but through your obedience to me and only me. That's the way it is. And I'm sorry, but I'm not apologizing because that's what Jesus said. See, but we will foolishly, we'll leave here today and we'll foolishly continue to be baffled by this good news. Because for Christ to redeem us from sin, he must condemn our sin and set us on a path of righteousness that we, oh gosh, we do not normally choose that ourselves. We come around all different angles. We'll do shortcuts, lie, cheat, and steal, but rationalize it's okay. When our kids tell us you shouldn't be doing that, we we'll go, shut up, folks. <laughs> Just do what I say, not what I do. No, Jesus said, come on now. They're going to do what you do. So, Christian, Christian, if, you've, if you receive Jesus, then guess what? There are people watching you that don't believe yet, and they're looking for why they should believe. Give them a good reason. And you know the best reason when you don't understand is just apologize for not doing it right. That's going to rock their world. You're right. I was wrong. You want to give them a quick retort? You're right. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. You're right. I was wrong. Ha <laughs> ha. Guess who's won? Because if they don't forgive you, then they're in bondage. Just, just forgive. Throw it out and you're free. You are free, man. There is peace there beyond understanding. <clears throat> See, when Jesus meets Cleopas and Mary here, it's the same way he must meet us with redemption from sin. See, he explains to those two, he starts, when he's explaining to them, he starts in the Old Testament. And he opens the scriptures to Cleopas and Mary. He initiated three, he initiated like three things, They're these openings, if you will, that are mentioned in this chapter. He opened the scriptures to them, he opened their eyes, and he opened their understanding. Now, the first opening takes place in the middle of the story where Jesus tells them how foolish they've been to not believe what the prophets had said. Starting in verse, uh, chapter 24 again of Luke, verse 25. How foolish you are and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So, we're just like these two. I mean, we are Cleopas and Matt, Mary. I mean, sir, we're, you know, and for some of us, we're a little slow because they get it in verse 32. They finally get it. Just a little bit further down the road, okay? And they're reflecting on it, and here's what they say in verse 32. We're not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. See, that's the way God works, folks, when he points us to Jesus. See, Jesus, remember how Jesus began at the start of his ministry? He, he goes into a synagogue in Nazareth, all right, his hometown, right? And it's the Sabbath day, and he begins to read from the 61st chapter of Isaiah. Now, this is recorded in, of course, Isaiah 61, but the Gospels have him. So Luke chapter 4 is the one I'm just showing you up here. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. This is from Isaiah. So this is from the Old Testament, from the Torah, for the Jew at that time, because they didn't have what we call the Bible. They didn't have the New Testament, okay? So this is Luke right then recording it. Good old physician Luke, man, and physicians are detailed. So here he is. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. That's you and me, to set the oppressed free. He's talking to us. He's talking about us, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So when Jesus had finished reading these words, he sat down and applied them. And here's what he said. He said, this day is the scriptures fulfilled in your ears. Right? So a little while later, the gospels say that the disciples of John the Baptist. Now remember, 
Jesus is coming on the scene and John the Baptist was, you know, the, the New Testament version of Elijah. And he was leading the way, preparing the way for Jesus until the Messiah came. So those guys were following John the Baptist and Jesus finally pops up, starts his ministry here. And they came to Jesus asking if he is indeed the Messiah they've been waiting for. And once again, Jesus referred to this very same passage. So, where are you going to find out about the truth of God? Because see, there are different ideas about God. There's a lot of writing about God. Where can you find out the truth? The answer is, you will find out about God as you find out about Jesus. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. So Christian, if an unbeliever or somebody who's doubting or just like Cleopas and Mary, do you understand? They're going to find out about God through you. That's our assignment. And don't take that lightly. That's why this is a big deal. But it's a great day to understand fully what this is all about. We've got an incredible opportunity in front of us this day, right here, right now, to be articulating in our body, in our language, how it is that we could be so loved for what we've done. You do it by forgiving. You do it by serving. You do it by sacrificing. You're doing it by being last because the last shall be first. This is just a blink of an eye while we're here, folks. It's just a blink of an eye. This is not eternity. We've started into eternity. This, when, when we leave here, it's not the end. This is a beginning. See, and you find out about Jesus when you open the scriptures. Now, the second opening is in Luke chapter 24, verse 31. And it's kind of a consequence of the first. Meaning, Jesus had been teaching them on their walk. He was showing them the Old Testament and talking to them. And then he sits down with them. He was going to leave and they kind of begged him, the Bible says, to stay. He's like, oh, I'm going to get going. They're like, no, no, stay and break bread with us. Have a meal with us. All right? So they're eating in their home and the scriptures say their eyes were open and they recognized him. Just think about that. All that time he's walking with them, they couldn't recognize him. This is as true today as it was then. If you and I will open the scriptures, God will open our eyes by means of his Holy Spirit so we will recognize Jesus. See, we try to make it so complicated, folks, but it's extremely simple. It's elementary. Even a child can do it. See, faith in Jesus comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, the third opening is the one we find at the very end of the story after Cleopas and Mary had returned to Jerusalem and had told the other disciples of Christ's appearance to them. And just think about that. The night prior, they wouldn't go back to Emmaus because it was night, sunset. So they didn't go and they waited till the morning because Passover was over. They could walk. It's not a break in the law. They could go. They chose not to. Now they get home and it says it's dark the next day. They're so excited about meeting Jesus that that seven mile trip, not a problem. You know, just think about it. Seven miles, you walk a good clip, 20 minutes a mile. So that's a little over two hours. You know, probably that first day, the day when they met Jesus, they were probably doing about 30 to 40 minutes a mile. Man, that sucked, man. We thought Jesus was it. Now he's dead. Can you imagine them high-stepping it? They were probably jogging, man, to get back and tell the disciples that they just had a walk and dinner with the risen Lord. Okay? So they get back and tell everybody this, and the Bible says in Luke chapter 24, verse 45, as they were speaking, Jesus appeared again in their midst, and he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit does this today in our lives, folks, when we study the Bible. And these three results should also occur for us when our Bibles, when our eyes, and our minds are opened. When Jesus opened the scriptures, we are told that their hearts burned within them. They were saying, isn't this exciting? Isn't this thrilling? And of course, the opening of scriptures should be equally exciting for all who study them today. Now, if this isn't true in your life, here's the deal. You're not really truly getting in the word of God. That's all. That's okay, but that's the truth. That's where the rubber meets the road. If you're not excited about it, that's okay, but you're really not getting in the Word. God knows. I don't care what you tell me. It doesn't matter. 
You, 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 you to tell your friends, whatever. If you're not excited about Jesus, then I'll guarantee you, it's no doubt, you're not in the Word of God. You're not in the Word of God. See, and please know that there's another benefit when Jesus opened the eyes of Cleopas and Mary to recognize him. See, no doubt, when they had arrived in Emmaus towards the end of the day, they were tired. It was dark, right? Nevertheless, they experienced an immediate desire to tell others about Jesus Christ. So without any great deliberation, they set out for Jerusalem that very night. I just talked about that. Perhaps the, the risen Christ always would lead to such action in us. In other words, there's always a testimony when you meet the Lord. See, and when Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures, they entered into a new phase of their life in which they understood both the scriptures and the Lord differently than they had before. Because prior to this encounter with Jesus, the word was a mystery to them, obviously, because the prophets talked about it, but it went right over their head. So, but I'll, I'll guarantee you, after you meet Jesus, right, when they return, for you and I return to the book of Genesis, for instance, and you read about the seed that would crush the serpent's head, well, they would know that that seed was Jesus, right? And therefore, the book of Genesis is, well, that's a little more exciting than it was, right? And they would understand the Lord a little better. Then you'd read a little further and find out that Jesus is not only the seed that will crush the, the serpent's head, but he's also the seed of Abraham, the one who is to bring blessings to many nations. And they'd be able to re recognize the fulfillment of that prophecy. And that, and that was proclaiming, you know, the Gentiles are going to be welcomed. That's the most of us. I don't know if there's many Jews here. If you are, praise the Lord, because you're his apple, the apple of his eye. But we're grafted in, so praise the Lord. See? So Cleopas and Mary, when you're reading Bible further in Genesis, you're going to see Jesus all throughout the life of Joseph. In Exodus, Jesus would be perceived as the Passover lamb. In Numbers, Jesus is the rock in the wilderness from where we all receive the water of life freely. He's also the cloud that glides his people and covers them with his protection. Remember, cloud by day, fire by night. Deuteronomy pictures Jesus Christ as the righteous one. Joshua, he's the captain of the Lord's hosts. In Psalms and in the prophets, we are told of the Messiah suffering his death and his resurrection. In a couple of the uh, prophets, in Ezekiel, Daniel, for instance, and a couple others, we learn of Jesus' second coming in great power and glory. The last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, portrays Jesus as the son of righteousness, risen with healing in his wings. These three openings that Jesus shared with these two, the openings of the scripture, the opening of our eyes, and the opening of understanding are three great blessings that we should all desire today of the resurrected Lord. Because when the Bible is open and we see the Lord Jesus Christ as he's interpreted to us by the divine operation of the Holy Spirit presence here, we will never be the same again. The word itself is going to be different for us, folks. It's not going to be such a mystery to us. We're going to have a craving to learn more about it. See, it's going to have a theme in the Word of God now for us. It's going to make more sense than it ever made. And you know what else? It's going to be a great blessing on each and every one of us. Because it's going to be the place where you meet Jesus who died for you, who now lives to be known by those who follow him. Amen. So, yes, these two disciples on the road to Emmaus had been devastated by Jesus' death, had the, as had the other disciples. Because they didn't expect it, despite the fact Jesus told them repeatedly of the betrayal, crucifixion, and resurrection, they still missed it. But when they heard from an angel that Jesus had risen, it changed the disheartened, frightened group of blue-collar folks, which is most of us, into bold preachers of the gospel. And for most of them, you got to understand, bold preaching of the gospel means... If necessary, use words. You getting that? It's just your actions, folks. If you need words, great. But if you can do a kind thing, you're preaching the gospel. If you can sacrifice for somebody, if they have a need and you fulfill it, praise the Lord. See, the resurrection of Jesus impacted those few disciples so much that all of them but John died a martyr's death. 
and not one of them, not one said they made it up, right? Jesus was alive and they wanted the world to know that they'd be willing to die for it. The reality is, folks, each and every one of us in here is going to die. There's not a thing you or I can do about it. The good news is that because Jesus died and rose for the dead, you and I can live forever if we receive him. See, the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we're celebrating today was the death of death. Death died that day. Death was defeated that day. The devil has no sting anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you've got to understand it in your mind because he's going to play mind tricks on you. You've got to renew your mind, folks, to this. See, death is not the end. And Jesus is saying that to you and I right now. Here's what he's saying. This was Jesus talking in John chapter 11. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though you die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, Jay, you can come on up, please. Now, folks, for many of you that go here, you know this is the time that we've been building to for our building campaign pledge. I have a very short story about that, leading into that. In 1904, there was this man named William Borden, and he was the heir of the Borden Dairy fortune at that time. Maybe some of you have heard of Borden Dairy. Started in the mid-1800s, and he graduated high school in Chicago in that year. And a graduation gift from his parents was to send him on a cruise around the world. And back then, over 100 years ago, a cruise would take a couple months. When he's on this cruise, God began to open William's eyes and heart to the masses of unsafe people in the world. His first letter back to his parents on that cruise was, I think God is calling me, Mom and Dad, to be a missionary. And his final letter from that cruise from that, around the world, he told his parents in a letter, I know God is calling me to be a missionary. One friend of his expressed amazement that William was throwing his life away by choosing to become a missionary. Now, when William returned home, he enrolled at Yale University where he was instrumental in starting campus prayer groups and a Bible study group and an evangelism uh, initiative in the area there of New Haven, Connecticut. While in sc school, William re renounced his fortune in favor of missions and wrote two words on the inside of his Bible. It said, no reserves. Later on in college, he attended a student volunteer movement uh, conference in Nashville, Tennessee. And he learned there about the great number of Muslims that were in China. When William graduated from Yale a few years later, he had many, many lucrative job offers, including the one to take over the family business. Multi-million dollar business. Uh, over a hundred years ago, folks. Just put that into perspective today. All right? But he was determined to fulfill God's call to serve as a missionary. So he wrote two more words on his graduation from college day in the inside of his Bible, and it said, no retreats. So William set sail for China on December 17, 1942. He stopped in Egypt, however, to study Arabic so that he'd be better equipped to dialogue with the Muslim population in China. While in Egypt, William contacted spinal meningitis and died April 9, 1913, four months after he left at the age of 25. Years of training, a promising future, and William never made it to China. When they opened his Bible after his death, they found that William had written those words on the inside. But in addition to the words, no reserves and no retreats, William had jotted down during his college days, those two, they found two more words that William put in there, which was no regrets. Although William Borden never made it to the mission field in China, he touched hundreds of students at Yale University and Princeton Divinity School, who then became missionaries. And because of the news of his death was published all over the world because he was such a prominent figure, right? 
Many people wrote letters to the family expressing how their lives had been influenced and changed by William's story of faith and commitment to the cause of Jesus Christ. His story continues to inspire people all over the world for the cause of Christ. I share this story for this reason. As the band comes up, we're going to be making our first offering today as a church body. Our first step in faith in this three-year journey, let's all start it together. Let's do something. Let's do our part and sacrifice today as we follow the Lord. Remember, folks, sacrifice is when you love something so much, but you love something else more. You'll sacrifice for it. Now, folks, here's that point that we were leading up to. There's going to be people up here to pray with you if you need. We're going to receive communion. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we take communion here. Now, we understand the crowd here, so we're going to, in the back area, the, some of the ushers are going to have it by the aisle. But there's a table up here. There's a table back there. There's a table over there. And there's a table back there. We understand there's a lot of us in here, and it's crowded. Okay? But we encourage each and every one of you to partake in this. It's serious because it's a personal thing. And as people are going to be making their way to, to receive communion, Jesus said, do this to, in remembrance of me. And we're going to do it today with the specific emphasis on that we're remembering him to thank him and admit those things where he falls short because he is risen. And, and if you're here and you haven't received Jesus Christ, now's the opportunity. Receive him. It's a free gift. Don't leave here today not receiving the free gift of salvation. We all have sinned. We all make mistakes. Folks, do not be ashamed. This house here, this group of people, this group of believers are going to love you, are going to accept you for wherever you are. But if you will humble yourself today, you will make what Jesus did for you so worth it. Now, as the band plays this final set, I encourage each and every one of us to rise to our feet and participate in these events and these things that we just talked about. Amen.